Right, I think we'll make a start, if that's okay, with everyone. I'm just going to introduce myself. My name's Gregory. I'm the Finance and Operations Manager at Culture Central. Um, we set these workshops up with the um, producer page, and, um, and we've had some workshops going on all week. So thank you for registering for this one. Um, if you don't know, Culture Central is a leader and a collective voice for arts and culture in the West Midlands. We are, um, and as part of um, during COVID and what's happened, we set up a cultural response unit um, where we, and part of this, we wanted to set up some workshops for um, networking and upskilling for young creative um, and artists and freelancers. So we've um, brought on board some regional industry professionals like Rua and Maria, who will be leading today's workshop sessions. So I'll hand it over to them and they can introduce themselves and start the session today. Morning everybody. Thanks for joining us. Rock, you okay if I just uh, delve in? Yeah, carry on. I'll give you a go. <laughs> so um, I'm Maria Howes. I'm currently leading the marketing team at the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, um, also known as the CBSO. Um, and I was most recently responsible for leading the digital strategy for the CBSO's 100th birthday celebrations in September. Um, we did a live stream concert from a warehouse um, in Longbridge um, and that was with Sir Simon Rattle and Adrian Lester presenting um, and we also had soloist Sheku Kanamason on cello, you might have seen him in the Royal Wedding um, and also um, a fantastic sitar player Rupa Panasar also joined us as well. Um, so we live streamed that and received over 175,000 views in the month of September. Um, major national PR coverage and international partnerships. It was a really, really exciting project, but all quite nail biting. Um, pre COVID, uh, CBSO had the highest ticket income of any UK orchestra. It represents around a third of our overall income, which is um, a scary ticket target of £2.3 million each season, which represents around 100,000 tickets. And this is just for our own promoted Birmingham concert series. We do perform around the UK and all over the world as well. Um, just a little bit about me. My whole career has revol revolved excuse me, around arts and culture. Um, I've worked for other music organisations, including Birmingham Contemporary Music Group. Um, I've worked for the Arts Council. And I was also a freelance marketing and audience development consultant working with a range of museums, art galleries and um, symphony hall as well. And I'll pass over to Rook. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I'm Rock John Stevens. So I lead marketing comms and audience development for the Culture Coventry Trust. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the Trust manages, um, we look after the Herbert Art Gallery Museum, which downstairs focuses on the history of Coventry. So that's things like Lady Godiva. Um, and then upstairs, we focus on the visual arts. That's everything from sort of our own art collection right the way up until hosting the Turner Prize next year. Um, some of the other venues we manage is the Coventry Transport Museum, so that's the largest collection of British road transport in the world, and then the Lunt Raymond Fort, which shows how Roman armies trained way back in Roman times. Um, and then across those sites, we welcome around about a million visitors a year through the doors, and we engage around five million through digital activity. Uh, prior to joining Culture Commentary, which was about three and a half years ago, I've worked in a variety of different sectors. Um, so from pharmaceutical companies right through to Burger King. Um, and I suppose in terms of each sector, each has its own quirks, but all follow the same principles. Um, and I'd just say that arts and culture organisations focus more on audience types and how we engage specific new audiences as well. Um, so for today's session, uh, we're going to cover a few sort of basic introductions around marketing, comms and audience development. So first thing is going to be a bit of an overview around the basics of PR. Um, then we're going to do a bit on marketing, what is marketing, um, an intro to digital marketing, audience development and then video content. And then we're hoping if we've got time at the end to do a few Q&As. So at this point, I'll hand over to Maria again just to do an introduction to marketing in the creative sector. Thank you. So um, marketing and communications functions are resourced in a, a variety of ways across the sector. So whether you are work, whether you are working in marketing teams or whether you are working 
with marketing teams doing another area of the arts and creative sector it's it's worth knowing this um, before you begin so you might come across um, well you will come across different approaches and styles of marketing um, different size teams so you might you might um, come across an established internal team something like what if you work with the CBSO that's what you would come across um, or external ad hoc support um, to working with multiple teams from different organizations if it's a partnership project um, that you'll come across different levels of expertise sometimes um, in an arts organization one person does it all so from the admin to the artist bookings to the finance and the marketing so they you know they're, they're doing everything within their within their job but if you are able to embrace some of the elements that we're sharing with you from our experience you'll be in a good place to make those connections and ensure that the audience is a consideration in all the elements of your your work there we go Perfect. Cheers, thanks for that. So um, firstly, it's on to the basics of PR. So before we begin, I thought I'd share a really quick video clip, which I'm hoping it will let me share really easily. So, da -da -da -da. You should all now be able to see that. So I will hit play. I'm sorry, Mum, but I've never really seen what it is you actually do. <laughs> PR! <laughs> yes, but PR! I make the fabulous, I make, I make the crap into credible, I make the dull into delicious. delicious. <laughs> My PR darling, and yet they would bloody honour some pea-brained hypocritical do-gooder like her. Well, you all sound the same anyway. So... Oh, just to get rid of that. Right, so I thought it was just useful to share a real quick sort of um, video that summarises about PR, but also the fact that not everyone knows necessarily what PR might be. Um, so I thought initially then we talked through a little bit around what, uh, what public relations, aka PR is, and how organisations communicate that. So PR is predominantly... Um, how an organization promotes itself and builds a positive reputation and public image. So marketing typically is focused on specific products, whereas PR focuses on man maintaining sort of positive reputation. So what people associate you with. Um, so the way an organization is represented in the media has a big impact on how people perceive it. Um, and the reason for PR, um, why it's so important, is that it influences the media on how you're represented um, and how the media communicates your key messages. So particularly, you know, in the arts and cultural sector, it's really important that your projects and what you're working on is communicated clearly and accurately to your audiences. So PR is a key part of that. Um, and integrity is key. So it only really works when your messaging is aligned to your values. So, for example, if we think about RuPaul, if RuPaul ran a campaign about equality, you'd probably buy into it and think it was a legitimate um, you know, PR campaign that fit with, with his brand. If Donald Trump ran one about equality, I doubt you'd probably feel the same. So if you're working in an organisation or representing your own brand and you want to protect it and how people perceive it, then the actions that you take to do that is PR. So... A majority of you may be doing PR activity without even realising that you're doing it. If you're passionate about how your brand's represented and how people perceive you and the brand you're working on, the project you're working on, you've probably got some key sort of fundamental skills around PR and what it is anyway. So I suppose one key example that we've dealt with in the last 12 months is um, we announced that the Coventry Transport Museum was going from free admission to a charge for attraction. Now, as you can imagine, we did a huge amount of work around our reputation and what that, that entailed. So the fact that as a charity, we need to be sustainable um, and, you know, support ourselves so we're less reliant on public funding. Um, 
as you can imagine, we, we thought that the majority of the public would support that decision. But actually, what, what you can often find yourself in a situation with is that, you know, people will question automatically, you know, why are you doing that? Is that actually OK for accessibility? Those sorts of things. So, you know, a really key thing to, to remember is always be, you know, hope for the best with PR, but you must prepare for the worst. So it's about thinking about, you know, these are the best things and the best outcomes we can hope for. And these are the worst outcomes and the difficult questions people might ask us. Um, and another good lesson that sort of I learned over that period is um, we've always um, sort of looked at our visitor numbers on a year on year basis and seen that as, you know, good, good visitor numbers for us at the Transport Museum could be, you know, half a million people a year coming through the doors. Um, when you go to a charge for attraction, your visitor numbers will, will creep down and, you know, Initially, we thought, well, actually, that, you know, this can't be good for our reputation. Our visitor numbers have gone down. We're not ac accessible to as many people. Um, but what we actually realised is we need to look at things in a slightly different way. So we started to look at, you know, benchmarking against similar attractions like the Think Tank. And we could actually see that we changed our reputation and profile by doing that activity. And actually now we were working on more of a destination level. Um, so that's a little bit of an example from something we've done done in the past and a recent example of how we've sort of taken some learning around PR from it. So things to consider when you're looking at PR and comms, um, obviously one that might stand out is a press release, a media release. So it's important to think about what your standout messages might be. Think of who the audience is that you're trying to reach. And um, a saying that I learned um, last week in another session is, you know, don't we all over it. So instead of saying, you know, we are trying to do this, we are trying to share that with you. It's about putting yourself into the audience perspective, the person who's reading that release and making sure that actually you're speaking to them and what, what they're getting out of that project. Um, another thing is contacts. So relationships are everything with PR. So network and keep in touch. So, you know, if someone asks you, do you want to go for a coffee date? Do you want to have a catch up? And I'd recommend it. It's crucial you do that. Some of the people who I've kept in touch with over the years may have been that we worked in completely different places. And from a work perspective, we probably weren't that relevant in our relationship at the time. But now I work with them really closely because, you know, they've gone on to a different role that fits with with what, what I do. And it's a mutually beneficial relationship. But I think, you know, contacts and relationships are absolutely key with PR. Um, even when it comes down to things around, not necessarily from, um, you know, sharing your messages, but even if you're running an event, you know, we've had, an, we've had examples where someone's let us down with a, a PA system for an event and I can just call someone up at a, a sort of local venue and say, desperate last minute ask, can I please borrow your PA system? So if there's one, if there's one key takeaway, I'd say make sure that you try and build up your contact base and keep your relationships as close as you can. Um, another key tip is check, check and check again. So frequently asked questions will become your best friend. So before you issue anything to, to the press or to um, media sources, you need to think about what are all of the questions I might get asked. So that's thinking about, you know, the nice things that you might be asked as well as some of the more difficult questions. So whether that's, you know, things around, are you reaching all of the audiences you should be? Um, how are you funded, all of those sorts of things. It's about having as many answers as you can signed off and ready to go um, in case you do go into an interview situation with press and, you know, they ask you something, you're prepared and you've got that answer. It's a, it's a lot easier going into those situations with that. Um, the other thing is media training. So public speaking isn't for everyone. So if you feel that you're going to be put in a position where you're going to be speaking to the media about a piece of work, um, then it's really key that you, you know, either prepare yourself for that or you take some media training. I'd say it comes with um, expertise in terms of experience. So the first couple of interviews you do, you'll feel really, really nervous, um, I'm sure, unless you're really, really confident. I know I certainly wasn't. And with time, the more you do it, you'll sort of feel that actually it's, it's very much a conversation with someone that's being recorded, similar to this. Um, and the other thing is to remember with PR, it's okay to pay sometimes and for some things you might have to. So for next year, for example, at the Herbert, we're going to be doing a lot of sort of national and international exhibitions. 
I know that I don't know someone who works at the New York Times or the Guardian who can guarantee that we're going to have some great coverage. But by liaising with a PR agency, I know it's far more likely that we'll be able to secure that coverage. So sometimes it is key to remember that you may have to have an expert in that area to deliver that service for you. So a couple of um, good examples of PR that I'll run through very, very quickly um, is you may be aware of the, um, the two seesaws that were installed across the Mexican border um, last year. So that is an example of an artist really increasing his profile and his reputation by doing something which would be classed as PR. So it's a rep for him, it's a reputational thing. It's, he's shown that he cares really passionate about, about something that's attracted media attention. Um, so that's one, one example of a, of a PR campaign or a PR a stunt in a way. Um, and then another is you may have seen um, last year, there was a girl who bought a dress from ASOS um, and people weren't very nice on the comments about it. So ASOS actually took the photo of, of that lady and they used it as the marketing image for that dress and it went viral. Um, and the key thing from that, from ASOS's perspective, is thinking about, you know, how can we improve our reputation? And that shows that, you know, they're supporting that their, their consumers who are buying their goods they feel passionately about and they're boosting their reputation by supporting them and making their customers the face. So again, it's another example of how you can do you know, positive PR. And a not so good example of PR, which springs to mind, is uh, Opoly, which is a fast fashion brand did a competition for NHS workers um, over the COVID lockdown. Um, and they threw a virtual slumber party for all of the NHS workers that had won this competition and they could get sent sort of hampers of free clothes. Um, however, they were completely driven by the fact that it was a PR stem and that they needed people to be in the room in order for them to get their, um, to get their gift. However, one of the nurses was obviously working a lot of hours at the time and said, I'm on a shift at the hospital. I can't attend the, uh, the virtual slumber party, to which Alt Polly said, well, you know, if you, if you can't attend the slumber party, then I'm afraid you can't have your hamper of goods, which completely turned into a PR disaster for them because, you know, rather than thinking about their integrity and what their core messages were that they were trying to support NHS workers, they were thinking solely about PR and how it looked and not about the integrity that needed to back up the campaign. So there's just a few little examples of PR campaigns that people have done where they've worked well and also not worked so well because they haven't been sort of honest in their approach to it. So at that point, I'll hand over to Maria to do a bit of an intro to uh, marketing. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so what is marketing? I think it means different things to different people, but one of the most common um, definitions I come across from people who are working outside of marketing is that it's all about sales. Um, I'm a marketing professional, but my passion is, has always been around audiences and how they access and engage arts and culture specifically, because that's where I've, I've been working all these years. And that hugely influences um, my practice. So for me, marketing is about the people, those who make it, and that's, um, I'm talking about the, the artistic uh, product, uh, those who engage with it, so you, your audiences, your stakeholders, and those who share it. So those, experience, those shared experiences, you know, you see families engaging with a theatre experience or something that they've come across in the street that's an artistic representation. That is what encompasses marketing for me. It's all about the people. Um, so whilst income targets can be a driving force, I mentioned earlier that um, my ticket target is quite high at 2.3 million. I do get a little offended when marketing is seen as the department who just sells the tickets. So sometimes it's nice um, just to realise that marketing is just so much more than that. Um, and I think if you're ever working with within or with a marketing team, it's really worth getting to know what their um what their passion is what drives them what they're measured by but also what they're trying to achieve with their with their messaging and their relationships that they're building with audiences um, so i found a, a definition of marketing by the american marketing association which i think is quite apt and i'll just read that out it is marketing is the activity set of institutions and processes for creating communicating 
delivering and exchanging offerings that have value for customers, clients, partners and society at large. So I, re I really like that because it's about the creation and communication, but that exchange of offerings, I quite like that term and it's quite a nice one to use in arts and culture rather than product. That sometimes feels a little bit harsh. Um, but that the that whatever you're doing has value with who you're trying to engage um i think the perception that marketing provides the end goal so if you are looking at marketing in terms of that you've made something you've worked on a project and you then go to marketing at the end of the project to say right i've got this can you do something with it get people engaged sell the tickets um i think that approach can really trip projects up and affect the size variety satisfaction and the future engagement of the audiences that you want um, which is I think it's really important I think Royal agrees with me as well that it's um, really important to make a connection and develop a relationship with your marketing colleagues right from the beginning and maintain that connection um, throughout so I've just got a diagram to share with you which I hope I can do let's just do this so I'm going to talk you through the four P's of marketing. So bear with me, here we go. Can you see that? We got that. Um, so these are the four P's. It's really easy to remember. You don't have to become a marketing expert to, um, to, to understand, but it's a really good way of breaking down all the different areas that marketing uh, fits into. So your product here. Um, that's what you're offering and who who is it for? What makes your product stand out or your offering, if we're talking about that definition that I just read out? Um, what is your competition? Are there other people offering similar things? And considering how you're branding that project, your values and how you're presenting it. Then we've got price, which is fairly fairly self-explanatory but that's how much you're going to charge it might be free or it might be a certain charge but there's a consideration around either of those things and how much to charge how much do your competitors charge how do you want your product to be perceived and what's the what's the perceived value of your your offering to your customer what what would they value in monetary terms or it could be time or the expense to get to your offering all of those things need to be considered then it's the place. So this is location, location, location. This is where, where can people access your offering, whether that's in a physical, a physical space or on a digital platform. And it's also about the when they can do that and how. So, you know, relating to Rourke's recent example of, of the um, poly campaign, um, they, they didn't consider when that NHS worker would be able to access, access that product. And then promotion is the fourth P, um, and that's communicating your offering and driving engagement. So they are, we can provide this as a document afterwards. They're really important uh, things to consider. That's the section on marketing, just to give you a quick whistle stop. Um, I'm gonna go straight into branding, is that okay with you, Rock? So, um, Branding, which is one of the things I talked about in the product P, um, it's not all about the logo. I'm just going to share one other picture with you. Sorry, I'm a bit slow at this. Hopefully that's working. Yep. Okay, thank you. So branding is the term that refers to the name. So for instance here, dairy milk, the term, um, moment of calm here in Twinings, um, your tone of, tone of voice, distinctive design, um, and the visuals that you use to represent one organization or offering from another. So it's really not just about the logo. The logo is, you know, is something that's important but it's you know here Kellogg's logo is absolutely tiny it's all about their visuals their representation of the product and their engagement with their intended audience um, and here with the magazines it's about the tone of voice the particular things they want to highlight to their audience and the visual style in this role my seat So it's important to consider branding really early on. Um, 
because it is a key part of the product that you're creating. Um, you might be working, as I said, said earlier, you might be working with a range of marketing teams or you know, a range of organisations. So you need to consider who are the partners that are involved in your project. Are you working to an already established brand? And if you are, what do you need to consider within that? And is this a one-off event or do you need to build an audience over time? Um, and that will all lead into what you end up with your project or your, your outcome, what that will all look like. There's a couple of other top tips for branding that I have for you, which are um, consider the values of the organisation that you're presenting. Choose your target audience for the message that you want to convey. Communicate through the appropriate medium where your target audience will be. So for instance, the, the Kellogg's example, um, you know, they're, they're obviously targeting children for their cereals. So, you know, making sure that those adverts in the right, are, are in the right places. Um, and consistency is also key. Um, there's, uh, at, at the CBSO, there's, um, we've got 100 performers in the orchestra and also a staff of 40 and several different projects throughout the year and everybody wants to you know have ownership over what their project looks like but there has to be brand consistency across and that's not so that you're stifling uh, creativity but it's just so that it doesn't end up looking like a mishmash you just need to make sure that your your brand and your representation of all those different elements just has that consistency across it so that anybody could recognize who your organization is Rourke, you were going to step in with uh, with another example. Yeah, so um, I thought a couple of key examples that we could maybe maybe talk through would be a couple of really recognisable brands. So similar to what Maria was saying, consistent brand makes it a recognised brand and that, in, as a result, builds trust with your visitor or customer or consumer. So if we go to Walt Disney, for example, uh, so Walt Disney once said, if you believe in the thing, believe it in all the way. Um, and I think it's really key that you can see with Disney that every aspect of their brand, you know, whether it's you're looking at Disney Plus through to a Disney film, the moment you've probably seen that for five to ten seconds, you can pretty much tell that it's that it's Disney. Um, and that's because every single aspect that you see, whether it's a, a Disney theme park through to a, you know, a film Frozen, for example, every little detail of that story is planned and analysed to see if it fits with a brand and fits with who their consumers are. And that's why it works from, you know, their brand can evolve from being a film through to a theme park, through to being, you know, a streaming service online because you, you trust that Disney will provide you with, a, you know, an experience that you trust. It's something recognised and it's something that you'll, you'll enjoy. So that, that's one example of a really, really strong brand. I suppose in terms of the arts and cultural sector, thinking about where there's a brand which really sort of jumps out as, you know, as soon as you see it, it's recognisable, I would say is the Tate. So the Tate, many of you might not know, they actually have just over 20 logos in total, um, which, you know, you're, you're completely free to use um, if you work on a project with them and you can choose which one fits with the tone of your of your project so we know that it's not necessarily a specific logo that makes tape what tape is so it might be things that you recognize the font that they use and some of their in their text it might be the way that they use their imagery but it's also their tone of voice so the way that they're probably quite daring in comparison to other um arts organizations um but the key thing is that is that the moment you see something, you know, it it really showcases you to you that you know that that's Tate is recognisable, um, and just so you can sort of see why they decided to to have so many logos is because they like to show that, you know, art is is perceptive to the audience, so it reflects the idea that you know Tate is always Tate, but different, so it will evolve over time. Um, Tate's brand now is over over 20 years old, they've added new logo additions over the past last sort of six, seven years, but it will always, you know, remain that they intend to use that brand for the next 50, 50, 60, 70 years, and it will just evolve. And I think that's the key thing with a strong brand is, you know, consistency and being recognizable builds trust. Um, I know that as soon as I see a Tate exhibition, it's got Tate branding on or I associate with that brand, I know that I'm probably gonna think it's a great exhibition when I go. Um, 
But yeah, so that's two key sort of strong brand examples. And I was going to show you some visuals for what that looks like, but apparently it's really difficult to find anything on their brand guidelines for either. Um, but yeah, so uh, hopefully that gives it away a little bit from uh, talking through it. Back to you, Maria. Thank you. So one of the things that the cultural sector has been um, challenged with during COVID is looking at digital as the new norm. Um, for years, digital has been advocated across the arts and cultural sectors as an add-on. Um, it's something separate that we should be doing more of. Um, and we saw that with the rise of an, <clears throat> a number of jobs with digital in the title. But digital art has had its place in the cultural landscape for decades. Um, and digital marketing became a new buzzword and sounded technical and complex. But the essence of marketing, those all important four P's, hasn't changed. Um, it's just simply the channels that we're able to use within those four P's have opened up. So I'm just going to run through a couple of things that you might come across in digital marketing, um, which is... Uh, it's, it's almost like a marketing tool belt, which has added these, these digital means on. So there's, th these are essentially the internet, um, your website, or, it, or you might have a blog if you don't have a website perhaps, um, social media channels and email. Email is sometimes forgotten as part of that digital toolkit because it's been around for so long, but it is a really important element. So one of the terms you might come across is search engine optimization, SEO, which is the, it's earning traffic through unpaid or free listings. So it's the process of optimizing your online content so that your search engine is likely to show as the top result in Google, for instance. So if you type in Google, CBSO or City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, the search engine, the, the SEO that happens behind our, behind the scenes on our website means that that's, that comes up as one of the first items on, on the Google page. Um, so that's really important to make sure that that's in, in hand. Otherwise, you know, you might, if you, if you go onto the second page of Google, you're really, really searching for something. So you need to make it easy for people to be able to find you. And that's what SEO does. Um, is it just quickly on that, Maria, I was just going to say, um, if anyone's working within, a charity or a non-for-profit organization for SEO, you get ad grants from Google. Um, so effectively you can get $10,000 a month to advertise on Google that Google will just give to you. So if you are working in a charity or a non-for-profit, it's a brilliant, you know, you have probably haven't got a huge budget to spend on digital marketing or SEO, but you know, there's, there's money that you can access for free just by being an, a non-for-profit. And it's quite easy to get registered for. I just thought that was quite useful to throw in. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about is content marketing. So this has been around for a, a long time, around 300 years. Um, Benjamin Franklin, around 300 years ago, began publishing his annual Poor Richard's Almanac, which was a sort of publication to promote his printing business. So the, the reason he did it, he, he made this sort of um, publication, wasn't to, to talk about Poor Richard, although that's what it did. Um, it, he actually did it to promote his, his printing business. Um, and it's all about storytelling um, rather than simply trying to sell something or persuade someone to do something. Um, and I think I've put this in the digital section because I think, um, you know, through social media um, particularly, um, there's a real opportunity here for the cultural sector to do more of this storytelling. Um, I know certainly for the CBSO pre-COVID with the ticket sales target we had um, and, and the number of concerts, our social media channels were flooded with it's this concert next, it's this, you know, it's this concert next. And actually um, people get fed up of that. And there's, there's sometimes more value in telling a story around it and making things more relevant to people rather than just the end goal of trying to get someone to come to a concert. So I've got a couple of other examples. So one of them is this Lego comic, comic that my son gets. Now he gets it for free um, around three or four times a year. And in there, it doesn't advertise Lego even once. No sets are advertised at all, which surprised me when I first saw it. But there's, it's really cleverly done the way, can you, can you see this? 
sort of. Um, it's really cleverly done the way that they use the different characters that are within their existing promotions, playing different games, making different buildings. So there's no straight advertising, but my son then goes, oh, you know, I really fancy that. You know, how, how am I to do that with my set? So they, they, they're trying to get um, the, young, the young readers to do more with their own sets of Lego, but then it's also sparking imagination, thinking, oh, well, you know, if I had this set of Lego, I might be able to do this with it. It's really, really clever without actually um, advertising anything. And I've also got um, a example. I'll just do this. So this is an advert that I absolutely love. Um, I'll just share with you now. Am I sharing? Yep. Graham, love, can you give me a hand? That advert. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yep. All okay. Um, that advert. Um, yeah, it really gets me every time. I think it's really clever the way he told the story of Graham. You see the pictures of him and his wife and his children when they're young. Um, you, you don't see what the advert is about until almost. It, it buys in the viewer. You. you you, you're drawn along with Graham and his journey and his, his stares. And then when he disappears, it gets me every time because I think he's died. But, but he hasn't died. He's moved on. And it's so clever the way it comes in, you know, the right move, the right move logo at that point. Um, and then you see Graham on his journey. And I think that's a really clever example of content marketing where they're just bringing you into a story. And then, I mean, I, I have no intention of, of moving house just now. But right move is on my on my mind because that advert has really spoken to me um, and then another example is the John Lewis ad the Christmas ad that comes out every year and other organizations like Aldi are also doing those where they're telling a story getting you to buy into a character um, and inevitably you know adopt their brand values and and hopefully buy their product so moving on from that, um, I'll talk about social media marketing, which I'm sure everybody is, is pretty aware of. Um, there's so many platforms that you can use now and they're always evolving. We're always feeling that we're behind with the latest um, platform that, that people are using. But you just need to be aware of where your intended audience are to choose the right platforms. You don't have to across everyone all the time make sure you're in the right one um, at the right time and it's also not all about the number of followers you have on your channels I mean the more followers you have that you know that obviously extends your reach but it's about reach and engagement so um, not every post you you send will reach all of your followers because of the algorithms that are involved around um, behind the behind social media um, it's also not about how much you post it is on some channels like Twitter that's a conversational platform but for instance on Facebook if you spam your Facebook um, profile Facebook algorithms stop you from sharing so much so actually if you did less your posts might reach more audiences um, and then the uh, email marketing 
I mentioned just not to be forgotten it's so important to have that direct connection it's it's an instant way of communicating with your audiences and you can do it in all kinds of different styles so it's a really good one to play with um, and then there's pay-per-click advertising which is just the same when I mentioned how digital marketing is just marketing with digital tools um, it's just like advertising in a newspaper or a magazine or on the television it's just that you've then got um, a different platform to advertise on and it works in a very very similar way um rock do you want to talk about managing digital marketing yeah. products yeah so i thought it might be just coming on the back of what you're saying maria around um social media marketing i thought it might be worth me just saying a couple of things around our platforms and who engage with them sort of across the different sites we use so our facebook channels that we use across our sites are a big driver for family family activity so we know that we engage a huge amount of families via facebook um, so for example we did an event last year at the transport museum called um, robot day and we predominantly did a, a facebook campaign for that and um, we know that we can drive that activity straight to to parents who are looking for things to do with their, their children so we ran a campaign for, for four weeks. Um, I think we spent around £200 in total on advertising that. And we got, I mean, this doesn't happen all the time, but we got 6,000 people through the door over the course of one day just through knowing that that audience engages with us on that specific platform. And it was very much coming back to some of the content marketing that Maria was saying about as well. We, you know, we tried to do it. So it's very much around the outcome of this podcast uh, sort of visiting this project in this day is that you'll understand about all of the ways that you could get into a and sort of career in science or technology and it's more than you might think it is so it was about thinking about sort of you know female scientists and how they're driving forward transport innovation and how that starts at a really young age with when you're taking toys apart and rebuilding them and those sorts of things so it's just a nice way of sort of showing how that all comes together to form a former campaign and then similarly our Instagram following we know is our sort of 18 to 30 audience um, so if we're trying to drive say a lakes event at the Herbert Art Gallery we'll use Instagram as a driving force for that because we know that it's very visual and our demographics on Instagram are a lot younger. Um, we've tried TikTok, failed miserably not for me, not for me at the moment, but uh, Black Country Living Museum have got a TikTok account and that is, I think it's gone completely viral. It's, you know, I've, it's internationally shared now. It's, um, and that's very much because their brand is very much in terms of living history. So I think they've got a lot of sort of historical figures that lead that channel for them. And again, that's helped them to reach a much, much younger audience. So just a few examples of things that I know sort of cultural sites are, are using those platforms for but as well as that I thought it'd be useful to sort of talk through on a day-to-day -day basis managing digital marketing and those platforms for an organization and what that can entail so as much as it's very much sort of around your marketing and your campaigns that you're running and engaging with with your visitors there's also now a sort of people are engaging more with you online. So you become sort of the, you know, the admi administrative person for the organization a lot of the time. You'll guide people into making their decisions by the, you know, the queries that you respond to. So you're almost becoming, although people don't necessarily see you all of the time because you're, you know, engaging with them via a computer, you almost become that front of house role as well as that sort of back of house role, if that makes sense. Um, and I suppose an example of that as well is um, we, when we announced charging, um, as you can imagine, we had quite a lot of negative feedback as well as positive. Um, and, you know, it's a lot for one person to constantly be shielding all of those inquiries um, online at one time. So it's good to think about, you know, if you're getting a lot of mixed messages or you're doing a campaign where you're, you know, you might get people who are maybe been a bit more negative than they are positive so to share that out if you can or to try and take a bit of time away and you know it's hard to sometimes put a bridge between what people are saying to a channel on social media and the person that's receiving all of those comments so it's really important from our side is just to you know remember to distance yourself where you can and try and share some of those queries and things online because it you know it can be a lot I mean we at one point were having hundreds and hundreds of comments a day some really positive and some really negative so we tried to share that out so everyone was taking a piece of the pie rather than 
than one person, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, digital for us is similar to what Maria was saying. We don't see it as a as an extension or anything different. It's just the different platforms and channels that we use to to engage people with the campaigns we run. I think that's right. back over to you for a bit of a audience development now, Maria. Yeah. So what is audience development? Um, this is about looking at your existing audience or your community, if you're starting from scratch, and making decisions about how you want to influence, change or develop it. Um, so there's, there's four, four C's of audience development to help you along. So the first one is community. So that's creating and being involved in a community by location or by audience type. So that could be age, it could be interests, it could be background, it could be a number of number of different um, demographic uh, areas. Um, but really understanding who it is that might engage with your, your offering or who you want to engage before you create that offering. Um, caring is the second C. This is all about customer care, um, making sure that you've really thought about your, um, your customer from, from the start and that you have the processes in place to be able to support their engagement. So that's everything from booking a ticket to being able to get to your venue perhaps. Um, so that's giving information about parking um, and um, using systems that are easy for customers to be able to access these different things and having a support there if, if anyone needs assistance. Um, we do have to support our customers. We have quite an older customer demographic in the main for our core concerts. Um, and whenever we have an on sale that's predominantly online, we have to make sure that we've got extra team members who can take calls and support customers who you know, can't remember their login and things like that and support them through that journey. That's really, really important. Um, it's as important sometimes as the thing you want them to come to. Um, also within that caring bracket, it's about showing an appreciation of your, your customers. So if you've got really loyal customers, perhaps doing something for them, making sure you say thank you um, and, uh, and not spamming people with inappropriate messages constantly, really thinking about who you're, who you're communicating with and when it's appropriate and what it's appropriate to communicate with. So the third C, so we've had community, community caring, Collaborations is the third one. And this is about working with others. So for instance, we might work with Culture Coventry and, and Rourke on trying to um, cross promote our activity if we wanted to reach more people in Coventry, for instance, and vice versa. Um, it could be about get, having some ambassadors um, who uh, you work with in a different way to reach more people. Um, it could be corporate and social partnerships, again, to reach more people, to extend your values um, and to make sure that you create content that is relevant and that you're not just going back to what Rourke said about the try, try not to we all over everything. It's making sure that your content is relevant for the people that you're you're communicating with and you're not just saying we're doing this, we're doing that, and you must engage. That's that will never, you know, work. It's it just about it, it wouldn't work with a friendship. So you have to think about audiences like this. They, they're your friends, and you need to respect and treat them well. Um, and the final uh, C, the fourth C, is connections. So making real connections with your audience further than the the product, the offering itself, um, and showing a real understanding and appreciation of them. So that's audience development. It could be that you want to develop, um, you could have an audience already and you want to have develop your audience so that you have more of the same kinds of people doing the same kinds of things. Or it could be about diversifying that audience or you've got a new product and you want to go and try and find a new audience for it. That's what audience development is, quite a, a number of things. Um, audience segmentation is something that we use all the time in marketing. Um, a definition of that is the practice of using data to segment your audience by demographics or interests in order to find the right person on the right device or in the right place at the right moment. Um, 
we'd all love to reach everyone all the time with everything that we create because we think it's wonderful um but whilst we might not want to put ourselves into specific boxes segmentation is a really key tool for anyone beginning to plan a project for public consumption in order to tailor it communicate it effectively effectively um, to make sure that you have your intended audience in mind if you don't segment your audience you won't you won't be able to do all of the other things that I've said, the four C's, making things relevant um, and that communication because you'll just be trying to do too many things all at the same time. Rourke, you've got uh, an example of um, one of the segmentation tools that's available for all of us. Yes, so um, we are funded, part funded by the Arts Council. So as part of being funded by the Arts Council, we have to adopt their segmentation methods for reporting. So the uh, Arts Council use something which is called the audience spectrum and I'm going to share my screen and it's only very dull what I'm sharing because it's a list of the different segments that Arts Council use but it gives you a bit of a flavour around sort of the segments and how they're classified so there's 10 segments which they use to segment the UK population and sort of as an extension of what Maria was saying it's not you know it's not by just demographic and those things, it's about your behaviour. So it's pulling all of those different aspects together to then form, you know, groups that you can then try and engage with. So they have wildly strange names. So you've got Metroculturals who are prosperous, liberal urbanites interested in a very wide cultural spectrum. So Metroculturals, um, I won't do this for everyone, but Metroculturals predominantly um, are people who work in arts and cultural sector um, or they are engaged with culture a lot of the time. They see it as a key part of their being. They're very, very engaged with arts activities. Now, Metroculturals, you'll, as it says, urbanites, you'll find them in sort of bigger cities. So London is where probably 90% of Metroculturals can be found. Then you've got um, sort of areas in Birmingham around the city centre and some of the universities where you'll find Metroculturals. Oxford's another key area. Um, but it's very much based around things sort of interest, where they're located, how easy it is to access culture, those sorts of things. Um, commuter land culture buffs so that's a segment which is affluent and professional consumers of culture so they're people who are probably quite well off live in a nice town somewhere maybe they live in Leamington and they will um, they'll engage with culture a lot and they'll go to they see it, and again they're very engaged they see it as something which is a key activity so as I'm talking through these you might have someone who jumps out to you and you think actually you know that's Bob who I worked with on this or that's Donna who lives next door or, you know, maybe that's Karen. I don't know. But you can start to see that some of these things you might be able to stand out to say, oh, actually, that links with that person. So highly active, diverse, social and ambitious is experience seekers. And again, they're one of the highest engaged segments. They engage on a regular basis. Um, you've got dormitory dependables, so they're from sort of suburban or small towns and they've got an interest in heritage and mainstream arts. You've got trips and treats, so they enjoy mainstream arts and popular culture influenced by children, family and friends. So that's someone who's likely to go to the Panto once a year, they might go to Legoland occasionally, but it's very much driven by, you know, what their children and their children's friends are doing and what their family have recommended to them. Um, you've got home and heritage, so rural areas and small towns, they engage in daytime activities and historic events. So that's people who may go to a medieval market that's been put on in a historic venue because they're really interested in seeing the culture and history of the, the place that they live. Um, you've got Up Our Street, which is a segment that's sort of modest in habits and means. Um, so they engage in popular arts, entertainment and museums occasionally. Then you've got Facebook families. So again, Facebook families is a really big segment in both Coventry and Birmingham, and it's a younger suburban sort of group. They enjoy live music, eating out, and popular entertainment, again, such as pantomime. So it's very much driven by um, sort of activities that you can do with your friends or your family for a day out. They're not likely to go and see an exhibition to sort of reflect very often. Um, you've got Kaleidoscope Creativity which is a mix of backgrounds and ages. 
so occasional visitors or participants for community-based events and festivals so kaleidoscope creativity is something where people won't engage very often they don't necessarily see the you know they might look at the herbert art gallery and think that's that's not for me it doesn't speak to me it's not representative of, of who i am as a person so again that's very often with audience development when you're trying to reach new audiences and diversify your offer that's something which you know us as an organisation at Culture Commentary will try to reach out to kaleidoscope creatives. Um, and then you've got heydays, so they're older, often limited by mobility to engage with arts and cultural events, so they participate in arts and craft making. Really easy example of that is if you know someone who's in a care home, it's highly likely that they're in the heydays segment. They're not likely to come to you unless it's on an organised trip, but they will engage with arts and craft making if it's taken to them. So behind all of those different segments they've got um, profiles for each of the 10 segments and that's defined by the geography, the likely ages, their income, the number of people they live with. So it's about shaping a behaviour for 10 distinct groups that sort of capture all of the different wealth of people who live in the UK which is why audience development is so important and so crucial is if you're trying to make sure your offer and activities can be engaged with and reach the right people you need to look more than just you know people who live in a specific area or who engage in a specific activity it's around that whole picture about their lifestyle you know how they might hear is it word of mouth is it through a campaign all of those things and that then leads into you know converting people into to visiting you and becoming a a visitor so that's a, a quick very dull sort of slide to share but I think it's useful just to see as sort of an arts council organization what it is that we have to adhere to and target people via. And I think it's really important that those considerations are made as early on as possible um, in order that the you can shape the activity so one of the examples we had was we had a group of youth ambassadors um it was about 13 people aged um 16 to 21 i think it was um and uh, they were absolutely brilliant so enthusiastic really had loads of ideas about the concert they so they were going to put on a concert and they, they basically had the floor. They, they were able to put forward their own suggestions of their programme, the artists they wanted to work with. They needed to work with the orchestra, of course, but um, around that, they were able to make the decisions. And they were so excited about the repertoire that they was important to them that all these ideas were coming around. Um, but then the programme only started to take shape um, when, when they started to consider who their target audience was so I had a session with them on marketing and they really started to hone that down and that's what took the you know loads of ideas they could do everything that would you know everybody would love it to oh actually who we who do we really want to get into the hall to share our music with and they decide th there were two prongs because they wanted to um, introduce our core audience into some of the things that they enjoy but also to bring a totally new younger audience into the hall so having those conversations before they nailed down the program was so important in that they, they did tweak some of the program items once they'd started to think about who it was that they were trying to engage um, and you know they, they didn't go through this segmentation model um, but but that was an element of segmenting by age and interest and, and where they might find their audience and it influenced the entire project they fantastic I suppose and you know the key thing about audience development is it's split across not just the marketing functions but also across the wider program so when you're thinking about you know we're putting on an exhibition or we're putting on a concert or whatever it might be it's working and engage it's also an extension of engagement so you might be working with communities on shaping that offer to make sure that it's reflective so you know we can look at these audience segments and say well we you know we think we know what this sort of specific audience might want but it's always good to look at things like co-curation so working with those audiences and saying actually you know is this something that would work for you? Is this something which you would engage with? And that's a useful step as well in terms of reflection. Um, it's certainly something we have to do with exhibitions all the time to make them relevant to different audiences is to co-curate with the communities and go to different areas and you know different age groups and, and demographics and say, 
you know, we're looking at how, um, you know, the lived experiences of people of colour in this exhibition, we've got three curators that are white and one and one that's a person of colour, but that's not an active, you know, we can't just use that as a whole basis for an exhibition on the pe for people of colour. So we needed to work with people in those communities to shape what that exhibition looked like and what that content was. And as a result, people who came through the door and engaged with that and how we spoke to all those different audiences that engaged was led by audience development, but also the co-curated approach to it. So it's a lot of the time, I think similar to what Maria was saying earlier, people think, you know, it's just selling the project, sort of selling a product at the end of marketing, but that, it, that's not what it is. It is that wider how you reach audiences and how we shape and engage people. And, and retain them what's the legacy will they then come back again can we shape it so they'll return and they become loyal to us and you know we we shape and shift who it is that engages with us on a regular basis so i think it's over to me again to cover a little bit on uh video content so um i'm sure most of you by now will have noticed that there's a lot of video content on social media whether that's from a live stream event because we're all locked in lockdown at the moment or whether it's just you're sat at home for two hours on Facebook or Instagram scrolling through random videos because you don't know what else to do. So video gets hands down the best engagement online. Um, you know the average viewer remembers 90% of a, a message when they watch it but only 10% will remember about it if they've read it. So that's you know another sort of crucial stat is that video is is a key piece of content um video generates over a thousand times more shares than both images and text alone um and videos that are two minutes or under get the most engagement across all social media channels so whether that's um you know facebook instagram twitter tiktok all every single platform if it's two minutes or under for content you'll get higher engagement levels people after two minutes tend to think have i got enough time to watch the full thing that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a video that's longer but it's about trying to think about can we get as much information into the first two minutes to try and convert them to watch the full thing or to to visit us later down the line um and you know, just for some specific sort of platform examples, tweets with video tweets that have videos in them see 10 times more engagement than those without. So engagement is when people are, um, you know, like liking something, sharing something or commenting on it, not just seeing it, but actively, you know, engaging with that content. Um, and if you were to do a paid campaign, whether it's on Twitter or social media, if you've got a video in that message, you'll get 50% more return on your advertisement campaign if you've got a video in it. So it's definitely worth looking into. Um, you know, it stretches across LinkedIn as well. Um, people are 20 times more likely on LinkedIn to share a video um, than they would just a text-based comment. So if you're looking to share a project to a network you might have on LinkedIn, um, then again, it's good to include a video. Um, and even on Pinterest, you're five times more likely um, to make a purchase after viewing brand video content on the platform. So that sort of, you know, runs through that it's good. Video content is, is key. It's great for sharing content and it gets great engagement. Each platform has its own quirks. So if you're looking to post a video on Instagram, it's best to do it square. Um, if you are looking to share something on a website or Facebook, you should do that as landscape and portrait works best for an Instagram video on IGTV or TikTok. Um, and then as with everything to do with marketing really and brand experience, accessibility is key. So that comes down to things like, you know, is your color contrast legible? So for example, if you've got a light yellow background and you're using white text, you're automatically creating accessibility issues. So things like contrast and making sure that things are easy to read is, is key when you're making any marketing materials, but also with, with video as well. And subtitles are crucial. Um, I mean, I personally probably very rarely have sound on either on a video. So even beyond an accessibility point of view, I would more, I'm more likely to engage with video if I can read subtitles while I'm watching it. Um, and then with video, it always comes down to, you know, there's professional, 
versus amateur video and does it affect the results in in terms of what you're going to get back in terms of engagement and honestly from my experience it doesn't affect it in the slightest the key thing with video is making sure that it's as engaging as possible so one key example of that is we did a live stream tour of an exhibition with um with the courtauld so for those of you who don't know the courtaulds um it's a learning institution in london also a huge um arts organization they have a fantastic collection of different artworks um so we have a great relationship with them because they were funded on factories which were built in various areas, Coventry being one of them. Um, and we had some Cezanne um, works, landscapes on display. And we did a, um, a live stream which they shared. Um, now that was very much, you know, we hired professionals in, we had a Q&A with a, someone who was very skilled present, uh, presenting. Um, the results weren't weren't fantastic yet the actual setup in terms of you know getting it ready and making it look polished and professional was we spent quite a lot of money on it and real put a lot of thought into it and then on the other side we had a summer exhibition last year um where we had a gentleman called john who is from birmingham he works as a learning officer i think he used to be at birmingham art galleries um and he came in and he did a with an ipad how's an ipad got the curator and did an hour long tour of an exhibition, very sort of all over the place, technical difficulties, but because the presenter was so engaging, it saw five times more people watch it and engage with it after. So it's not about the fact that it needs to be a completely polished, high, you know, high end video that you need to create. It really is about the content and is the person in that video someone you can relate to and want to watch. So content is key, not necessarily the the production value there. So another key thing is around live streaming and digital events. So, you know, with, with COVID, I think now everyone's aware that if you were live streaming before, you're probably going to be live streaming and doing digital events into the future as well. Um, so, you know, it's really key that you look at the best channels and ways to do that. So one thing that Heritage Open Days release, so Heritage Open Days, once a year, they put on a festival where you can access sort of historical attractions. They put together a really interesting guide on how to do digital events and live streaming. So um, I'll share that um, after, after this session so it can be sent out with the, with the notes. It's got a really useful guide to, you know, how can I edit video on a free software? How can I do a live stream and get that out to as many people as possible? It's just a really nice guide in terms of how to do live events and live streams easily with a budget and without any budget at all. So we can circulate that after. It's really, it's really useful. Um, we've done quite a lot of live streams and we still found that it was, a, it was a, great, a great document to be able to see that you can subtitle things really easily for free using a piece of software rather than typing it in after each thing. Um, so I thought what would be useful as well is to look at a few sort of very short video pieces of content that people have put out on social media that show sort of good examples of grasping people's attention in sort of less than a minute. So I will get this up and share my screen. So, da -da -da. There we go. So this is one example from Instagram. So this is by BuzzFeed Tasty and it basically shows you how to make a full recipe in well less than a minute. Again it's just a really nice short piece of content that shows that you can engage people online really quickly and easily. I also did try to uh, to make this when I originally saw it but it, it didn't go quite as it looks on their, uh, their video, but I gave it a go. Um, so that's one example. And then I've just got one more to show. So this is from an IKEA post on social media um, and it's around trying to publicise their anti-slip map. Again, coming back to what Maria was saying about content marketing earlier, it's not driven necessarily by the product itself, but about, you know, how you can engage with it.
So again, just nice, short content that, you know, has a message, has a point, but it doesn't go in straight away and do a tour of this is what the anti-slip mat looks like. It's about trying to push out this is how it's useful and relatable in less than 30 seconds. So again, it's just a nice way to show that content doesn't have to be really long in order to be the effective and, and great video. So there's two other really quickly that I'll share as well is just a marketing campaign plan. Um, that we've used for a previous exhibition that sort of pulls in a little bit around what Maria was talking about earlier with the four P's. Um, so, so you can see here, this is for an exhibition called 13 Ways of Looking that we've, um, we did have on until the, uh, the lockdown, which just opened. So this is normally a basis that we start to work towards um, for a campaign. So you can see straight away, um, on this, because it's free, we haven't particularly added in about price um, on this, but that would normally be addressed at the product stage or around that point. So you look at sort of, you know, this is what our product is, and then you'll work out the price or the value from that. So they two, those two are very mutual um, usually. So we've got partners, which again is forms part of the, uh, the product, key selling points and messages. So that's the, the product part again and the key markets we're reaching. So again, this is done by the segmentation audiences that we have um, as part of the audience um, segment model from audience agency. And then we also have here, so you've got print, so that's looking at the promotion activity. You've got distribution, so that's the place that Maria spoke about, so how you're getting that messaging out to people. Um, and then you've got advertising, so again, that's looking at, at promotion. And then you've got digital which is promotion there's digital um sort of forms two parts so you've got sort of like the promotion part which is this is the messages and the product we're sharing and then you've got the place which is this is the channels that we're going to use to do that because we know it will reach specific audiences and then again you've got press which would fall within the within the promotion section so i can share a template for this if it's useful with some of the sort of four p's left in there um, but it just forms a really nice way to start thinking about, um, you know, if you're pulling a campaign together, these are the sorts of things that we think about and where they sit. Um, and one other really useful tool that we thought it would be quite good to share with you um, is a visitor journey map. So when you're initially looking at planning a marketing campaign, it might be useful to think about, you know, how and where are we engaging with people? So one way to do that is via a visitor journey map. So you can see here, this isn't one that I've, um, from our organization, I've just pulled it off Google, but you can see from, from on here, you've got touch points, which are the various times at which a potential customer or consumer will engage with you. So you've got things such as, you know, they've looked at a guidebook, and this is all the, what you're looking at at the bottom, you see consider going. So this is what you do before you've even made a decision. This is when you're considering it. So you've got things like word of mouth from family and friends and, and marketing through things like email. Then you move into, you know, you've converted that person and they're, they're looking that they might, you know, they might come to visit you now. So they're looking at organizing the trip. So that's things like, you know, is your website easy to plan a visit? Have you got digital planning tools? So that's things like your, your transportation and, and route journey planning. And then you've got your arriving. So that's things again around, you know, maps, is signage easy? Can you find the doors? Um, things that, you know, myself and Maria have spoke about, some really simple things that you can forget is how welcoming and, and sort of visual your doors are at the front of the building. I mean, we have that issue at the Herbert, and I know that Maria's mentioned that you've previously had issues just where the doors weren't visible and that can cause people not to, to come inside. Yeah, we had um, at the CBSO Centre, now, but um, we had uh, it's it's all glass windows, and it was a glass door that just looked like the windows. So if you know that's the door, then you you wonder why people can't just find the door. But um, but yeah, it was it, when people are coming somewhere for the first time, their their senses are on overload. They're seeing so many different things, and maybe the obvious to someone isn't the obvious to someone else. So you know 
trying to backtrack and think what those barriers might be to people getting to you and having a good first impression as they walk through the door um, is, is really important. No, definitely. And that, that sort of leads into the, you know, your arrival section at the building as well. So how easy is it to find your information desk? What are the grounds like? Is it accessible for people with, you know, different access requirements? And then you've got your experience at the building. So again, it's thinking about all of those different visitor journey touch points. So, you know, how are the front of house staff or the, you know, your, your devices within the space and all of those things, your cafe, how is the experience for the person who you're trying to, you know, to basically have a great time, but also to return. And then when they're leaving, how is it when they leave, does someone say thank you? Is it easy to get out? What is it that's the last thing that they'll remember as they leave your building? Because again, that can be a key thing around sort of will they return? Um, and then you've got exiting. So what it's like as you go back into the city centre. So we're all of our venues are on the outskirts of the city centre. So the key thing that we had to work with the city council on is if we're doing more evening events throughout the city of culture next year, you know, is it accessible for people to walk into the city? Is it well lit? We've got a cobbled courtyard outside the side of one of our buildings if that's not lit at nine o'clock in the winter that's a trip hazard no one's going to want to come back if they're taking the tumble after they've finished going to see an event and then it's when they get back home can do you make it so they can share their memories can they you know share that with other people will they return again and then the process should if you've done everything right start again and they'll come back to you but it's just a nice way of sort of mapping out all of the different touch points and the different avenues that you can use to you know get out the message to people but also considering what and how their experience is when they're with you and um, but we can we can share that with you if it's a nice sort of basis to start thinking around a different activity that you you do and then i think it's over to to you maria for a bit of a takeaway yeah just we thought we'd just summarize with a couple of the key things that we've already talked about so our four takeaways for you today are um remember the four p's of marketing Relationships are crucial. That's relationships with your peers, your audiences, your colleagues, and your networks. Um, keep your intended audience at the heart of all decisions and make sure that that's right from the beginning of a project. So if, you're, if you do happen to be the marketer, make sure you're trying to get involved with projects right from the start so that you can really influence what happens in the audience that, that you might achieve. And the final one is digital is not an add-on it's the new norm and that's us done so if anyone has any questions i don't know how this normally works um <laughs> are you still there you can put them in the chat perhaps or feel free to uh reveal yourselves and just start talking to us I'll, I feel like we've done a really good job there then Maria we're getting all the points out there's no questions yeah can't see any questions oh thank you Roxy <laughs> yeah so I suppose a good example or, or strategy uh, Emma about reaching people who don't normally engage um, is from from my perspective is is co-curation so you know if you, if you have a specific audience who won't engage with you, the best way to try and find out, you know, how you could engage them is, if you can, is to try and speak to them. So you can make assumptions as to, you know, how can we engage a certain audience type who doesn't engage with us now in a campaign or to come to an exhibition or to, you know, to come to an event. But often it's worth going and having a chat with those people and saying, actually, you know, we're, we're running an event that's for this specific audience um, what what would interest you um, you know I think it's really key that with audience being at the cent center of every decision that you you consult with them along the way so for me that would be my main advice is to try and talk to them and you can do that in a variety of different ways and it might even be that if you don't have a, a straight into that community that there's organizations or or schools or a variety of different spaces where you can actually say you know could you do an introduction is there is there a leader within that community that can can sort of start that conversation going i don't know if that's the sort of thing you would you would do Maria. yeah absolutely i mean that's what we did with our um our youth ambassadors project as well because we just um i mean 
a lot of the people that that did end up being the ambassadors were were interested in music to start with um and were studying music so it but that they weren't an age group that we were necessarily engaging with so that that was where we were going with the youth ambassadors um and then they had connections with people who weren't interested in music at all had never been to a concert and that was you know what they worked on um but yeah i think finding finding some key influencers like you say uh well developing a relationship with them and then that can you know lead out into different things um, we've got a question from Misha. If we're working with a small budget and a small team, we both know what that's like. Um, what are the things you would prioritise as most important in a marketing plan? <laughs> do you want to go first, Maria, or do you? Uh, yes, I can do. Um, I would... I think one of the things I would prioritise in terms of making the most of your budget is email, because if you've got an email system and you have people that you can email, um, then that's a great way of engaging with them quite regularly uh, with different aspects of the thing you're trying to engage with. Um, I'd also, um, I used to work for an organisation where we wouldn't even have like £50 for a project. So you had to use um, connections with people. So again, finding people who could then pass the message on. Um, and what else would I say? Getting the rest of your organisation on board as well, because just because you might be the person who's in, um, uh, in responsible for the marketing doesn't mean you are the only person who has to market so for instance with the orchestra i mean there's a lot of people in the orchestra but trying to facilitate marketing through others so that then that can grow your your reach and also your capacity to be able to deliver things no it's very much the same for us even though we manage you know multiple sites and we're probably the biggest cultural organization in the city we have minute budgets to work towards. So I think it is probably a thing in the sector is that, you know, this is my only experience in the cultural sector. I've come from sort of organisations where they have huge budgets, more money than they know what to do with, which is a problem I'd like to have now, but I don't think you'll ever have in the cultural and creative sector. But, you know, the key thing I would say from, from my perspective is, you know, networks. So if you, can, if you can have those conversations about getting a message out there, fantastic. If you can build up a sort of bank of contacts with people at local radio stations, um, you know, local press, and you can pull together a media release, then again, that reaches hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people quite, quite easily if it's got a few, sort of, if they run it a few times. Um, and digital, again, is, is the most cost effective because you don't necessarily have to put a spend on it. So they'd be the two key things for me. And we haven't got any more questions. Should we just hang on for another minute in case anyone wants to ask anything else? Yeah. And I think with the um, with the information that we send out at the end, um, it'll have both my contact details and Maria's in. So if you've got any questions or anything to follow up after, or, you know, I'm, I'm conscious it's quite a big region. So if, if you're in Birmingham and you're looking to see what's around in commentary and likewise, feel free to ping over an email. Oh, uh, we've got a question from Emma. Everyone else is saying thank you. Emma says, Emma W says, any advice for people wanting to start in marketing, as in careers wise? Go on, Rock. You can you can answer that one first. <laughs> so yeah, so I suppose the key with the key with getting into a career in marketing, from from my perspective, I mean. It depends whether you want to work in marketing as a whole or within culture and creative. There's a lot of opportunities to try and do sort of like internships and volunteering in the sort of cultural sector. But it's, it is such a well-rounded sort of discipline that, you know, if you were to do some projects outside of the sector, you can always bring that knowledge back in. So don't feel like you have to completely go straight into the cultural sector to try and, to try and start a, a career in marketing in, in creative industries because you know the skills are transferable um but yeah it's you know it's great to start sort of if you can get in sort of marketing assistant role anywhere or even just volunteering those sort of initial bits of experience that you get really do make a difference when it comes to you know stepping into a role somewhere um 
but yeah, that's that's sort of it from my perspective. I started on um, I started about eighteen years ago on reception at CBSO Centre. So I didn't stay at CBSO the whole time, but that's where I started straight after university because I wasn't exactly sure what side of the administration element of arts and culture I wanted to be involved in. But then sometimes you can find that it's naturally the people that you start to watch, and you you know, or it might be the artistic planning that you you know start to get involved in, or the finance. Never for me, <laughs> um, but. Um, I think uh, sometimes it really helped for me starting in a really small organisation. So the, the, the reception job was also at the same time as being an admin assistant for BCMG who were in the same building. I did part time on each job and that gave me a real grounding in all the different things that you you know you, you can possibly do because in a small organization your your role is just much wider um so i you know i worked with the education manager i went on education projects with her i also started to write programs and things like that and then that's what started to evolve into marketing being my thing i'd have never picked that out of university i didn't even know what marketing was um and then um and then, you, you know, if you, I did a music degree, so I then needed to start getting qualifications in marketing and I ended up doing a, an art certificate. I don't know whether that's still available, but there's um, an institute called the Chartered Institute of Marketing, um, CIM, um, and that, uh, that did an arts award in marketing for, you know, for people who'd studied something else and needed to start to focus so I did that and that was a free course which was amazing and then I did a postgrad in marketing um so you don't I started with no marketing qualifications it was just sort of evolving from my interest in how people engage and the reactions that they have that's what makes me happy someone else having a great experience so it kind of that's how it how it happened for me but I didn't necessarily plan it from the start yeah i think it's um i think as well if you're working in a different role in an organization but you you know you want to have exposure to what marketing you know what marketing department is like and what their work is i would be very surprised if you said to someone who works in marketing i'm really interested to get a bit of an you know an overview of some of the things that you, you do can i lend a hand or can i get involved in some way I mean, as soon as anyone offers any sort of help to my team, we will bite your hand off. So it's worth just thinking about, you know, if you know someone who who has experience with marketing or works in a marketing function, you can just say, you know, can I have a bit of a bit of experience or can I help you with anything? Then that, again, is a great foundation for starting to see if you like it or, you know, how you can progress and see what sort of avenue you'd like to go down. Yeah, absolutely. Well, our time is up so thank you ever so much for listening to us for this last hour and a half um it's been that, we've got the music the table. thank you guys and thank you all for joining the session this uh, recording and any notes or any templates will be available as well for all attendees but thank you for all coming here as well mm -hmm. thanks everyone thank bye i'm going to try and take this right now you know if you don't mean the question I think we're all done then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. No, thank you. No problem. And I'll be in touch by email as well. Lovely. Should we catch up later, Rock? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm just going to go and do a thing with the with the kids, and then uh, I'll give you a call. Yeah. All right. I'll speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Very good to get back.